Okay, so Kit Stapley, lovely to uh, have you on the show today. Thank you, it's lovely to be here. Um, I'm not quite sure how to introduce you because there's so many things that you've done in life and so many things that I know that, that uh, you've done as well. And I'm sure there's other things that uh, you've got up your sleeve that you're going to surprise listeners with. <laughs> so um, so let's start with let's start with your name. Your name is Kit. That's unusual. Is that your real name or is it uh, your stage name? Um, it isn't what I was christened, but it's the name that everybody calls me when they like me or they're not cross with me. Oh. When, when I was 21, I said to my mother, you no longer have the right to call me Christine because you no longer have the right to be that angry with me anymore. Ah. So I actually changed it um, legally so that I bank accounts and passports are, are not confusing any longer. Right. Okay. How interesting. I didn't know that bit. Well, there we go. That's, it. that's, that's, that's out now. <laughs> Fantastic. So um, I know you as a, a health creation mentor and yeah. um, a yoga laughter therapist and a health creation uh, mentor as well as a health creation consultant. So which of those would you like to talk about first? Oh, I think it's always good to lead with laughter. Marvellous. Marvellous answer. Okay, so yoga laughter. Um, well, yoga I, laughter my therapy. first training was as um, a laughter yoga teacher. I don't actually teach laughter yoga any longer because I'm very sensitive to energy and I find it drains energy more than it builds for me. So I just work laughter into all the work that I do really and every day of my life. Okay, so using your training um, to enrich your life. Yes, and I wrote, I wrote a book of quotations to remind people to laugh every day, which I actually find is, is a perfect book to keep in the loo. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't what I thought when I was writing it. <laughs> okay, and, and remind me what that's called. I have a copy of it, and it's, it's verse, isn't it? It, it could be verse, that's because it. that always, in, you know, an anthology it is, yeah. and an anthology could be verse, but everything could always be verse. Indeed, yeah. absolutely, yeah. So, um, talk, talking of that, um, let's, let's sort of fast forward, or I, I don't know what, what but we're going to go full circle in a way, because um, uh, cancer, we, mm. we, we, both, we both had cancer, and uh, our stories are, you know, are, are sort of out there, but um, I always find it amusing, and I tell people that I have a friend who had cancer, um, nearly 20 years ago and all of the people that told her she would die is now dead and she's doing very well thank you <laughs> yes. two oncologists and my then husband and they they wrote you off and said it was curtains yes and and I mean this is something I feel really strongly about which is that you must never accept a doctor's reality because you and I know Elaine how very limited that reality is it refers to medical school in some cases 40 50 years ago and the world has changed completely and they discover new things that we're on the cutting edge of every single day it seems to me so the doctor's reality was that they couldn't cure me but that said to me, then, okay, then I have to find something else that will cure me. And I did. And, and what was that? You can't say, you make that statement without telling us what it was. So, so how did you get through? Um, actually, what, what led me out of the, the uh, vortex that I was in was encountering Louise Hay's book, You Can Heal Your Life. And it sort of dragged me I, you know it was magnetic um, so I got that book and I read it every single day at least one chapter I said all the affirmations out loud and I didn't even travel away for one night without it for three years so that was a really good path for me um, but I think I th two things I think one is that we're all individuals and what works for you 
is so highly individual um, that nobody but you can say what works for you. Um, I've worked for 15 years as a health creation mentor and the key for everybody who turns their diagnosis around is different. There's no uniformity. It's so individual. So that was one thing. And the other thing is, and it's not an easy thing to do, and I suspect it's exactly what you've done. We've never talked about it. But it is setting your intention and not letting anybody deflect you. When they say, oh, poor Kit, she's been so brave through all the chemotherapy, but now she's gone into denial. You can't buy into that. You can't be deflected from your intention, which in my case was to get well and cancer free. That um, is so, that's really so important. And, and in my case, it, I, I suppose that's what I did, but I never thought of it in those terms. There was never any question that I was going to die from this wretched disease. Never any question whatsoever. Yeah, so yeah. I suppose in, in telling, telling myself and the world that, I suppose that my intention was, was set, if you want to use a form of words. But it is so, so important. And it's, it's what I tell everybody. Um, you, can, you can throw all sorts of lotions and potions and supplements and treatments and all sorts. But if you don't have the intention that you're going to stay, you won't. Simple as that. Exactly. exactly. So your determination got you through as well as the various um, treatments that you had. And, and that was breast cancer, I think, wasn't it? No, the first one, we, we're in the reverse order. Ah. The first one I had was, was lymphoma, which ah, that's was right, yes. indolent when I was diagnosed. But then when it got aggressive, I had a stem cell transplant and that failed. Um, and I'd had masses of chemo and infections and God knows what up to that point. Um, but then when they ran out of options and they'd used every, cancer, every chemo drug they could, except two, which I hadn't had the legal limit of, um, they then wrote me off. And I, I said, well, no, I'm not ready to go. I want a miracle. And everybody was going, oh, poor kid, she's gone into denial. Yes, yeah, delirious. Yeah, oh, my God, the poor thing, you know, and, and all slightly patronizing. Um, but in fact, it was just, I want a miracle. And it felt so audacious because who, you know, miracles happen in the Bible. When do you hear of miracles in modern day life? Um, and I, you know, well, I certainly wasn't a Jesus figure <laughs> in any way. So I didn't think that I merited a miracle, but actually I don't think you have to merit it. I think you just have to be determined to get it, to have yeah. that vision yeah. Yeah. and not be deflected from it. Absolutely. So, so that was how many years ago now? That was 1998. Okay, so 20, years. 20 years. Yeah, your 20 years. Happy anniversary. Thank you. <laughs> happy happy can cancerversary, as some, some, some people say. So, well, um, I mean, I was diagnosed in 1992 and I spent the intervening time pretty much having treatment. I think I once made it two years without any treatment. Um, but, um, yeah, I, do you find this when, when you're working with people that... Um, it's so often people would not give up what cancer taught them. I don't know anybody uh, who has not said that the cancer diagnosis uh, journey hasn't, hasn't taught them anything. You know, it, it, it yeah, has revolutionized yeah. their life. And actually it was a blessing because had it not come along, um, other things would have happened in their life that they're now prepared for. Um, and also nothing, nothing phases us, does it? You know, no matter what comes along, like you, like your book, you know, it could be verse. I mean, I was burgled last week and I'm, I'm, I'm just thankful that nobody was hurt. Um, I have got stuff returned. It's highly inconvenient. My car's still missing. I'm still discovering things that have been stolen. You know, when we came on this call, I couldn't do the call in the room that I wanted because the thinking route has been stolen. 
and cables and all sorts. So, um, you know, it's a minor irritant. When you've been faced with your own mortality, it, you know, what else, what, what else is there that life can throw at you? So, yes, I'm, I'm definitely with you on that. Yeah. So, so through your mentoring, um, I, you would encounter to this as I, as I do as well with, with other people. So, so how do you turn people around in, with, with the mentoring? How does that work? Again, it's so highly individual. Everybody's journey is individual because everybody is here to learn something. I mean, that, uh, that's what I regard cancer as, is, is the universe going, I have a role for you and you're not yet qualified to play yeah. it. Yeah. I am sending you a training. And when you, when you embrace the cancer diagnosis as... Well, okay, what is it I need to learn now? Let's just cut to the chase. Um, everything changes. Mm, it does. And that's, that's so individual. What the role is that, that the universe has for us, what, um, what the obstacles are in, in each individual case just can't be um, summed up because... It's, it's an exploration and a journey with, with every single client. Never had duplicates. I, I think also it, it, it helps us to feel lighter, doesn't it? I don't know if you've experienced that, but I, I have, I have, generally I have a lighter feeling in life, sort of post-cancer and pre-cancer, that there's nothing that can't be solved. There's, no, there's nothing that can't be um, got over in some way or another. And actually, you know, life throws all sorts of stuff at us, but I'm, I'm, I'm very much in my head going, like, so what? Yeah, okay, fine. Well, there's a way around this. So yeah. if you can't go under, you go around. If you can't go around, you go under, you know, whatever it is to get around the issue. Well, so I'm a bit like that anyway, because, you know, I had tremendous learning difficulties at school and I, I was in my 30s before I discovered I wasn't stupid. Um, so I always make it up as I go along, really. Um, because the way people teach information doesn't work for me. No, it's it's very again that's something that's individual. There's something like 100. And, I think last I looked, there's 108 versions of dyslexia. I mean, really? Uh, yeah, yeah, 108 versions. Now, I, is that specifically word blindness or, uh, or different for, different forms? Things that come under the the major yeah. heading of you know, which is also dyspraxia and, yes. and those things. Yeah, yeah. So it's, as you say, everybody's individual. So you bring laughter into everything you do, clearly. So, you know, you're a light, light-hearted spirit and you do acting as well. Yes, yes, we're doing, we're in rehearsal for a um, play, which is a contraction of Midsummer Night's Dream at the moment, which will be played on the neighbouring villages, um, village, green and, and pond, um, to people on picnic rugs. Oh, and I get to play Titania. Oh, wow. <laughs> Very good. Very good. And when, when is that? Uh, July the 20th, I think. The Saturday that weekend, anyway. Right. Okay, lovely. I might see if I can come down to, uh, to Wiltshire then and, and uh, have some time down there. I might come and see you perform. Who knows? See that would be fun. That yeah, would be see fun. If, see if I can get this uh, interview out before then on the radio for you as well then. So, so where is it going to be when you say Village Greens? Uh, what, what's your Village Green network? West, West Camel in Somerset. West Camel. That's near Glastonbury, isn't it? We're not, not too it's far It's about half an hour from Glastonbury, exactly. Right. Okie dokie. And when is Glastonbury weekend? Isn't that coming up soon or has it been? Not this year. Oh, they're not doing it this year? No. no. They're, right. letting, they're letting the, the fields rest, I think. Oh, okay. So they're allowing the local... Uh, play companies, the the local actors, to to do their thing. So instead of going to to uh, on the west on the Camel uh, train, because there's there's a train station, isn't there at, at Camel? Isn't Castle that the one? Kerry. Castle Carey. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. yeah. Brilliant. Okay. So um, so that's coming up. Um, you've got the health creation consultant title as well. So so what does that involve? Well, that's really taking the health creation process into um, organizations, so like schools, which I don't know if you remember from your training, I was really struck by it because I've been working with the picture of health for 15 years and I find it a really useful tool 
to figure out where people are and what is their way forward. Um, and what's extraordinary about all the pictures of health that we were shown from schools is that they all had this, this same outline, which was roughly like a, an old fashioned um, knight's helmet. Yes. And that's extraordinary because that really means that in um, that particular kind of organis uh, organization, there are problems duplicated to a greater or lesser extent right across the board. And what's so wonderful about being a health creation consultant is that that process can help people to cure all those problems and change the outline of their picture of health to one that really is an organizational picture of health. So for the, for the listeners, can you explain what you mean by picture of health and, and what is the tool that you use? The picture of health is a spider graph, which means if you imagine a spider's web, um, it's circular and from a central point in the middle, there are 12 lines that go out. And the way it works is that in each of those 12, what we call principles, you answer 10 questions. So it's diet, exercise, detox, mind, spirit, um, body, energy, um, environment. And you, you answer 120 questions, yes or no, in total. And at the end of that, you have a really accurate picture to somebody who's, who's used to reading it of what's going on with you. And beginning there, we can change people's lives. Lives have been turned around by, by somebody um, literally just buying themselves a nice vase and putting it on their desk and putting fresh flowers in it once a week. We, it highlights where we're neglecting ourselves. And it's incredible, isn't it? I mean, they say every picture tells a story. So when you see the illustration of the spider graph, as you described it, you can see where the shortcomings are, whether it's in personal, personal um, environmental situations, or if it's external to you, or if it's, um, you know, uh, well, well, finance or, or, or um, actually, I'm saying finance, finance isn't in there, is it? Or is it? Not really, but it, it's sort of covered under stress. Stress, yes, yeah. So, yes, st stress is a huge one, isn't it? Yeah. So, so how do you, um, how do you, where, you know, where, where do you start when you're, when you're mentoring somebody? You, you get them to fill in the, the questionnaire first of all, do you? Yeah, yeah, that's, that's really interesting. And then if you remember it, it's a, along the horizontal axis, um, the top two quadrants are body and environment. So those are the material world, the things that you can see and are tangible. Yeah. Underneath that, the bottom two quadrants yeah. are mind and spirit. So in fact, if people are light on the bottom, if you know what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> they've got little bottoms, yes. Um, <laughs> yes, they've got little bottoms. <laughs> Um, you know that that those things are things they're doing to themselves. Yes. And of course, those are the easiest things to fix, actually. And they make such a huge difference. I love the story that um, Dr. Rosie Daniel told us um, about a session she did of, of, you know, everybody doing their picture of health in Ireland and I can't do accents. So um, I'm just going to treat this person as if she spoke exactly like me. <laughs> and she went up to Rosie and said, um, oh, you've got to help me. You've got to help me. How am I going to lose weight? How am I going to, I've got to lose weight. How am I going to do that? And Rosie said, well, let's have a look at your picture of health. So um, she looked at it and, and in her um, picture of health, it was really clear that her environment was really 
um, her biggest problem. So she said, tell me about your environment, what's going on there? And it turned out that she was living in her husband's house that he'd grown up in. It was his parents' house, obviously. And it was right on the edge of a quarry which had encroached and encroached and encroached and encroached. And she felt like, like she was about to fall into the quarry and it was really bothering her. And um, so Rosie said, does your husband know how you feel about this? She was actually considering leaving her husband because it was so, so traumatic for her. And, um, and she said, no. And Rosie said, well, I think before you leave him, it'd be nice if you sat him down and said, I've got to this point that if you insist on continuing to live here, I'm going to have to move out. And of course, once she explained it to her husband, how she truly felt, um, they moved. And she came back to the next year's um, picture of health creation, health creation session. And she bounced up to Rosie and said, Rosie, it's me. And Rosie didn't recognize her. She'd lost all this weight. And Rosie said, how did you do it? That's amazing. She said, oh, do you know, I didn't even really realize. I'm so happy we've moved. I'm in the house of my dreams. And her whole life had changed because she'd zeroed in on the one issue that she was just being brave about. And that's one of the things I find quite moving about being a health creation mentor is how brave people are, how they go, I can cope with this. Oh, I can cope with this. I can cope with this. And they're practically drowning. And then when you say, what would happen if you did so-and-so, they go, oh, you know, I couldn't possibly do that because we build up our resistances around a situation. And when, when you, you um, I don't lead people, but when I, when I don't drop a subject and I go, well, what do you think would happen? What's the worst that could happen? And what would you, if you knew that um, there would be no negative consequences, what would you truly do? people find that they can open up huge gussets in their life that they don't even know are there. Mm -hmm. It truly is the benefit of having a mentor and friendly eyes outside of the situation that you can see what's going on, but then also proven. Um, when you do the picture of health, it's a starting point, isn't it? It's a line in the sand and you can, people can then see their own picture and see what they're doing to themselves and um, a few hints and suggestions. People have the answers inside of them, don't they, at the end of the day? Yes, but, but I, it seems that nobody asks the right questions. Exactly. Um, until you get into this mentoring situation. And then so many things become clear. And I have to say, we always laugh a lot. Even, even if somebody's in extremis with, um, a real overwhelm situation I don't let them off the phone until we've we've had a couple of real chuckles about life and their situation that is important not to not to forget that we have a sense of humor I mean it's, it's almost like black black comedy isn't it really um, yeah you know, there, there, there is always a funny side on anything isn't there I mean you know whether it's using the commode or you know um, which, which I still have in my bedroom, actually. But I had a small amount of chemo for my last, um, my last kidney cancer, and I, I became incontinent, and nobody had ever come across that as a side effect of chemo. Um, but, but there I was. So, and I still have my, my commode in my bedroom because on occasions um, it's been very useful without going into too much detail. But, you know, <laughs> I think it's funny, and I've got you know, a couple of little things that are sitting on there, and, they, and, and I'm, I smile every time I, I look at them, you know. So... Yeah. There's always there's always an upside. It could be verse. It, it always could be verse, and always, you know, I have this sort of acting background, and for me, it's always about playing it for laughs and not playing it for for drama and you know tragedy and whatever. 
Um, and that's really one of the big reasons I got through everything I did. I, I really, I really, I don't know, I don't want to use the word hate because it's such a strong negative thing, but dislike. I dislike strongly intense. dislike. Yeah all these soap operas i think people get a bit competitive with eastenders and and um, neighbors and things and when something dramatic like a cancer diagnosis happens to us we can have a tendency to play it up because suddenly we're the center of the drama and everybody's calling us and saying how are you are you all right everybody wants to know the latest and you can get into playing it for drama and I think that's fatal. You don't want to, to you have any reason to keep this disease around. You need this disease to be laughed out of countenance. Yeah, absolutely. I'm glad you've raised that, actually, because I get, I, I do come across some people who, who it's very clear they do not want to get better. Yeah. And it's their get out of jail card. Yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, dear, poor thing, she died of cancer. Oh, dear, poor thing, he's got, you know, this, this awful disease or whatever. And, and they do play it up. Uh, and I've got over the years I've now become more um aware of the fact that you know not everybody wants to get better and, and that's to be respected as well if that's their choice we all have a choice don't we well I I um early on the person I I credit with writing the book with me because we collected the laughter quotations together uh, Rhonda Byrne she was a laughter colleague of mine and um, she was the healthiest person I knew. If she was stressed, she went swimming, she laughed at everything. And, um, and she died of cancer and she knew what I did. She'd given parties, you know, for, for, for the picture of health and, and things. Um, but she never asked me, what would you do, kid? And we were close. And I think that even if you don't know it, it can be your soul's chosen exit route. And that's the reality. We all, you know, we're all going out of here feet first eventually. Yeah, that's the only thing guaranteed in life, isn't it? Exactly. Yes, and not even taxes are guaranteed. You have to make some money before you get taxes. Mm -hmm. But, but dying is is non-negotiable and there is such a bigger wisdom than ours however wise we get to be when i nearly died and i did i was in hospital and um i already had a temperature of 105 but they decided to go ahead with putting in uh, lines in my chest and giving me the dose of chemo that was was um prescribed and um and then um apparently all my vital signs crashed and they called my husband and said you better come in she's not going to make it through the night and i came to at about three o'clock in the morning i suppose and i knew something had happened because I was different. I knew everything for a start. I knew how beautiful and how simple life was. And I knew that community was a much higher value than anybody in my life um, recognized. And, um, and it was so beautiful, that place. And I actually couldn't quite squeeze myself back into my body. Um, I couldn't. I couldn't spell. I was writing it all down, trying to trying all the insights and revelations that I had from being semi out of my body it was so beautiful, and I wanted to record them all, but I couldn't remember how to spell. Um, so I wound up spelling community with a double e, like you'd spell committee, because I'd forgotten all about wise. <laughs> yeah. um, but I've always been grateful for that experience because I know death is nothing to fear. It's beautiful. It's, you know, it's like we are in our bodies 
weighted down by as many pounds um, as we weigh of, of gravity. And when your spirit shakes free of that, it's marvelous. Have you read the book by Pat Pilkington, The Golden Thread? No, I haven't. I met Pat actually in, in the mental training, but um, yes. I haven't. Highly, read. highly recommend. And, it's, and Pat wrote it while she was um, dying from pancreatic cancer. Right. And um, I highly recommend it. It's, it's an extraordinary book, which um, uh, endorses what, what you've said. Absolutely. Really? Yes, yeah. I felt slightly cheated that there had been no hovering over my body watching them work on me and no white light that I recall. Um. <laughs> I've, I've had these experiences as well, not, um, not through cancer, but through a dental, dental uh, operation and uh, childbirth, two, two separate occasions. So yes, I'm, I'm with you on that. It is, a, it is an interesting experience, but it's not, not scary. It's just interesting. Uh, I found it. So, um, what else would you like to talk about? There's so many other things that I'm sure we could wheedle out of you, but we don't have an awful lot of time left. Well, I'd like to talk a little bit about um, my most recent cancer. When I called you, for which I will be forever grateful, um, and said, you know, they say I've got three invasive lumps in my left breast, and I know that you got rid of, of um, a year to live fourth stage uh, lymphoma yes. in eight months. So tell me what you did. And I took yeah. notes. 16 weeks, actually. Don't exaggerate. I've told you a million times. Don't exaggerate. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, so uh, yes, you phoned me. Yes, I remember. And so you, uh, from, from what we talked about, I took away hyperbaric oxygen therapy which I stuck with. Um, I took away Tim Part, the marvelous homeopath. Um, I was already seeing an Ayurvedic doctor because the detox diet that I had been on uh, for 18 months, I think, when I was diagnosed. So it was like, God, what more do I need to do? <laughs> what do I need to learn now? Yeah. Um, and uh, several little things that, that just became part of in my brain. I used to get out of the bath and smother my body in Jo Malone bath oil. Now it's coconut oil. <laughs> <laughs> and I used to, you know, spritz perfume everywhere. And uh, now my clothes get the perfume. Um, so there, there, were, there were a lot of things. But again, I think my takeaway from that, the biggest takeaway was... I set my intention and my intention that point wasn't a miracle. My intention was they wanted to, I said, look, let's, let's do a double mastectomy and then I won't have to worry about breast cancer anymore. And they said, Oh no, that's not going to work because it could have already metastasized. So, uh, I said, well, what do you recommend? So they said, we think you should do a lumpectomy, which would have taken the nipple and I'd have been lopsided, which to me was worse than being no breasted. Um, and so, I, okay, I agreed. But the day before the surgery, I had the strongest physical intuition that that wasn't the right path for me. It was absolutely clear the only question was what was I going to do about it because I don't like I mean I'm a bit of a rebel but I'm I I identify very strongly with the, the kid in the emperor's new clothes you know because but he's not wearing anything yes. <laughs> he's not doing it to make trouble he's doing it to be authentic mm. and I never like to make trouble but I learn that I have to be authentic. So, um, so I rang up the hospital and I said, I'm so sorry. Um, my intuition is absolutely non ambiguous. Um, and I'm canceling the surgery and they really weren't pleased with me. 
because we spoke i think we spoke on the saturday as you were due to have the surgery on the monday right it was, it was that close yeah yeah and i was planning to go ahead with it i was trying to get my head around how many times i had to wash with this you know special oh, that file stuff yeah it's disgusting <laughs> and all the chemicals in it oh dear and and i mean it was just really really strong and we don't have time to go into to all of those details now so it and it then seemed to me my intention was to make my body so healthy that even if it had metastasized that those would disappear because it's what is the point of nibbling away a piece that may have already metastasized I, to me that didn't make any sense once i started thinking about it through my lens mm -hmm. and um so that that was was it really um so what's your current situation my current oh well i did that it was just over a year when i went back to my surgeon um because you don't graduate to anybody else until you've graduated mm -hmm. from the surgeon uh, who's a lovely man absolutely lovely man and um and i've been really really ill in january um i'd lost over a stone and um i i you know none of that looked like very good news and i figured that my immune system might have been too busy with that to get rid of cancer cells so when he said to me it's gone i was completely gormless <laughs> i just went okay what do you mean gone <laughs> and he said gone and i said okay gone as in and he's a kid it's gone there is <laughs> no trace of it in fact you really need to know what you're doing to be able to identify the scar tissue it's gone Brilliant. and i mean i just i was amazed i was amazed i knew i was going to get rid of it but i didn't know that i was going to get rid of it that completely that quickly and and when was this that was in March. March this year. So where are we now? June. So you're still you're still celebrating, I guess. I yes, but I you know I still I'm working on my health because I still clearly I have a cancer predisposition. You yeah. know, for some people it's heart, for some people it's stroke. You know, that is where my weakness is. So for me, it's essential that I continue my vision of my body being so healthy that cancer can't exist anywhere yeah that is so important so many people that that i mentor um they do very well and then they go off the rails and they start eating badly or not exercising and and you know they get too much stress maybe they go back to work and they take on the you know an even more uh, stressful position whatever and then it comes back again and, and there they are a year later talking to me and you know we're same old position and they've forgotten all the things that they did to get clear yeah so it is it is a never-ending journey and, and it's interesting that people with cancer we talk about the journey and and it is life is a journey and, and with cancer you just can't let up can you at all no it's it's part of you know it's it's you deal with it it's like if you have long legs or short legs you deal with it yeah you don't buy you know jeans that are, are for the 32 inch legs if you've got 29 inch legs and just have them draping around in the in the hope that everybody will think you've got long legs it doesn't <laughs> work that way and cancer doesn't work that way either cancer you know is something that is here to teach you something and if you forget it it'll have to come again probably and slap you around the face until you got it yeah well that's interesting because my last cancer was was on my face it was skin cancer last oh, year right. which i which i dealt with so i've had four now that's quite enough i'm not going to get any more absolutely i'm determined that's it so i've had my slap around the face with with skin cancer um yeah. literally. You, still, you still follow um I yes. it's part of your yeah. life isn't I it? do I still see Tim I see Tim and I, I saw him last week actually I, I see him every six weeks um, do you? Yeah. I'm, I go I have my checkups in Swindon I live in Nottingham now mostly but um, I go I, 
I, I much prefer to go down to Swindon where I've trained my team, as it were. I, I go in and I ask the doctor how she is. Um, yeah. you know, I'm the patient and you know, I'm checking up on her health and you know, we find it quite funny. Um, I have my blood tests already printed out on the table because she knows I'm going to ask for them. Um, I, they're always fine, but I, I go through them myself so that they're okay. The National Health OK is not my OK. So I go through them, I, I, I go on Dr. Google and I look at all the different parameters and very often with me it's vitamin, B vitamins. So that's eating more, more seeds, yeah. um, um, uh, avocados, those sorts of things. So it's, we, can, we can transform our health um, through our diet and our mind and they're, they're the two key things, aren't they? Absolutely, and and like the story of the the Irish woman. Yes, the environment is huge. The environment is very strong too. Yeah, yeah. The mind, mind, body, spirit, environment, which are the four pillars of the the picture of health, aren't they? That that we both yeah. trained with Dr. Rosie Daniels. So um, there we go. So there's a little advert for Rosie. <laughs> Hello, Rosie. <laughs> so, um, are, are you are you open for business these days as a mentor? Are you continuing? Um, working or are you just resting? I am but I'm also writing a book because I did a talk at the Penny Bronze Centre um I missed your talk all oh, um, right we both yeah. spoke at the same event didn't we yes in yeah. earlier on this year yes and that went down so well um and you know people were bandying about words like you know legend and and that kind of thing and inspired people um that this key thing of not to take on your doctor's reality. Your doctor's reality doesn't know anything about who you are. And who you are is so powerful. That's who's going to beat this thing. Um, so I am writing a book, but I do have some vacancies for, for mentoring clients at the moment. So I'm um, so unavailable. People, how do people get in touch with you then, Kit? Well, probably the best thing to do is go to my website, which is Kit Stapley, S T A P E L Y dot com. Okay. And then you can get in touch with me through that, and you can have a little. It's, I haven't updated it to reflect this latest cancer story because I'm busy putting the book together and I don't know what aspects are going to wind up being in balance or so um yes do feel and and if people just want a, a quick chat I always offer a 30 minute absolutely free call so that we can get a feeling of whether we would work well together brilliant okay so that's kitstapley.com fantastic exactly. So that's marvellous. We've run out of time now. So thank you so much for, for being on the show. And um, thank you for having me. Forward to watching your progress as ever and flourish and um, look forward to meeting you going again in person very soon. Me too. Me so too. thank you very much, Kit. Bye for now. Thanks, Elaine. Bye bye.